We're sailing down the Bosphorus into one of the world's truly exotic cities, Istanbul. This is where East meets West, the only city in the world that straddles two continents. Asia over here, Europe to the right, and it's our gateway to a month-long adventure through the heart of Turkey. A long and rich history has shaped Istanbul into an entrancing city. For many centuries, this was the capital of the civilized world. These grand buildings, part of the legacy of those days of glory. In the heart of the city, there's an ever-present vibrancy. At the slightest hint of a gathering, the Turks strike up the music. See those fezes they're wearing? They were banned for 80 years in a bid to modernize the image of Turks. But now they're back and more brilliant than ever. And the lunchtime dancers, well, they're Russians, part of a huge immigration surge across the border into Turkey. But this man is 100% Turkish, Barish Senlin, our guide for the next month. Hoş geldin, Greg. Hoş geldin. Welcome to Turkey. Thank you very much. I hope you're going to enjoy the rest of your trip, which you will have a chance to see the Turkish cultures and traditions. Like we start with the Turkish tea, which is chai. Chai, this would be apple tea. This is elma chai. Elma chai. That's right. Elma chai. That's right. You're drinking Turkish coffee. I'm a strong Turkish coffee here. I'm going to need to say hello. Merhaba. Merhaba. That's right. Thank you. Thank you is Saul. Saul. Looking forward to it immensely. Enjoy. Saul. Behind us, these ladies are preparing a simple lunchtime meal known as gözleme. The dough is filled with meat and vegetables and fried on a flat hot plate. No rushing up steps for these waiters. It's wet our appetite for the delights of the journey ahead. A trip that will take us by two wheels from Istanbul to the wartime capital of Gallipoli down the Aegean coast to the Mediterranean, and then through the heart of Turkey to the Black Sea, and back west to the Bosphorus. Along the way, we'll encounter ancient Roman cities, cliff sides of calcium, and be surprised by a legendary horse. In a city of lava, we'll drift above ground and adventure below to find the home of the troglodytes. And everywhere the Turks amaze us, in dance and in trade. Turkish bars, Turkish belly dancers, Turkish delight. It's all here and more as we discover the delights of Turkey. It is the most splendid mosque in Istanbul. The Ottoman Sultan Ahmed I built this national treasure four centuries ago, and even though it's been officially named after him, it's more commonly referred to as the Blue Mosque, after the gleaming blue tiles inside. Since almost all Turks are Muslims, and so duty-bound to pray five times a day, the Blue Mosque is always packed with faithful followers. But, as Barish explains, the Turks have freedoms other Muslims lack. We have a 98% of uh, Muslim population, and we are a liberal population also. Alcohol, is, for instance? Alcohol is free, you can drink as much as you want, and they sell it everywhere. The Blue Mosque has been erected right alongside the 6th century church of St. Sophia. Now a museum, for a thousand years, this was the greatest church in the entire Christian kingdom. Some Turks replace quiet prayer with a fascinatingly mobile form of worship, the dance of the whirling dervishes. To prayers and music, ten dancers, known as semazens, make a solemn entrance. A ritual bow of their long symbolic fez, off with their black cape.
and into an ever so graceful motion that sees them spinning and spinning and spinning. They just do it once a week here, and these uh, whirling dervishes are really practicing twice a week, about two hours a day, uh, for this uh, uh, ceremony. They're taking this service very, very seriously. They almost look like they're in a trance. They are in the trance, actually. That's why how they keep their balance also. So this is a common thing that they used to do it, so that's, they, that's how they can stand up. The whirling is to induce a trance-like state opening the dancer up to spiritual union with God. I've counted some of them going around 44 times every minute, and we've been watching them for over an hour now. So in other words, they're going around more than two and a half thousand times. That they believe that they reach to, uh, to God with music, love, and dance. This is their philosophy, actually. Eight centuries after this mesmerizing ritual was launched, and despite a ban during the early days of the New Republic, the whirling dervishes are still flourishing across Turkey. But it's more than exotic religious practices that are flourishing here. Istanbul is a stimulating mix of the cultures of East and West. Its people are generous too, right down to the way they feed their feathered friends. And there's a tantalizing array of food and drinks to arouse the most jaded appetites. From an ornate vessel known as a Shabetchi Gugumu is poured a sweet cherry drink, Shabet. Now you see it, now you don't. And over at the spice market, it's an Aladdin's cave for a food junkie. Turkish delights, dried nuts and fruits, and would you like caviar? We have also caviar here. We're selling here spices, caviar, apple tea, fruit and nuts. This is Turkish Viagra. Turkish Viagra, yes. come on. <laughs> Figs and nuts and honey. Even more impressive is the immense range of goods on sale at the aptly named Grand Bazaar. 4,000 stalls offering everything from 22 karat gold, mined in Turkey, to ornate slippers, fashionable in Ottoman times, and known as taliks. Now this is what I call having fun with food. Pliable Turkish ice cream from the city of Maresh. the Blue Mosque, I prepare to leave Istanbul to explore the eastern half of Turkey. My guide, Mike Ferris. Mike, this is a very big country and you've got a very unusual way of showing it to us. Greg, I think the best way to see any country is on two wheels where you have the freedom of the air. Here's your motorcycle, here's your helmet, here's your gloves, mount up, let's go and see Turkey. Have a great trip. You too. <laughs> Mike's Ferris Wheels is leading this motorcycle tour out of Istanbul. Heading east into the countryside. Now our wheels may be rolling forwards, but it's as if the wheels of time are in reverse out here. While 21st century urban Turkey is busy modernizing, not much has changed in rural Turkey. One site that stands frozen in time is Anzac Cove on the Gallipoli Peninsula. The fishermen hauling their nets offshore are descendants of the Turkish soldiers who fought here in the First World War as the Allies tried unsuccessfully to win a clear passage through to Russia. The battle for the Dardanelles was a defining moment, not only for the Allies, especially Australia and New Zealand, but also for the Turks. Their country came of age in this very campaign, with the officer in charge going on to become a national hero. Kemal Ataturk went on to become president, creating a modern Turkey, but he never forgot the foreigners who died here. He erected this monument in which he pays tribute to them. 
Having lost their lives on this land, they've become our sons as well. Private 218 William Charles Belson didn't make it ashore on Sunday the 25th of April 1915. Australian soldiers are remembered in services like this at the Lone Pine Cemetery, with Queensland schoolgirl Kelsey Halbert paying tribute to an Anzac hero from her hometown in the Atherton Tablelands. He died on the first day. He didn't make it to the beach. So his war service was short-lived. He was 19 when he died. And at the nearby Turkish cemetery, Barish recalls the significance of Gallipoli to Turks. Well, Gallipoli Peninsula, we can call it as the bird of a nation, which we secure our lives and secure our country, our lands. In all, half a million people died or were injured in the infamous Gallipoli campaign. The waters of the Dardanelles were crossing are what the Allies and Turks were fighting for. Our plan now is to ride south down the Aegean coast of Turkey. But this morning, we're slowed by rain. Then, some sheep. Finally, a horse, well, not just any horse, a Trojan horse, straight out of the pages of history and Homer's Iliad. This is a famous legendary uh, Trojan horse and the legendary Trojan city here, which has been found in the 1870s by the German businessman Schillermann. So the legend, as I understand it, is that this wooden horse was rolled up to the gates of the city, soldiers inside, left as a gift. And at the middle of the night, the whole, all of them just take get out of the horse, open the gates of the city, the other Greek uh, soldiers get inside and kill all of them, and they just get the victory. All of which led to the famous saying, beware of Greeks bearing gifts, eh? Surrounding this modern Trojan horse, the ruins of ancient Troy. Archaeologists have unearthed the ruins of nine ancient cities, the oldest dating back 3,000 years. It's the first of our glimpses into the way life used to be in the Turkey of many centuries past. One of the great surprises of Turkey is the extent of Roman ruins here, with none better preserved than here at Ephesus. And what about this spectacular great theatre ordered almost 2,000 years ago by Emperor Nero to entertain almost 25,000 spectators. Indeed, Ephesus gives us a very good idea of what it was like to live in a Roman city. This was a great trading and religious centre, where cobble roads like the Street of Coretis led past dozens of imposing structures. Communal living was such that everyone would take their seats in the open plan toilets. And in a city renowned for its wealth and beauty, buildings like this magnificent double story library of Celsus were common. In fact, the body of the Roman governor of Asia Minor, Celsus Polymanus, lies beneath its columns, placed here by his son, who ordered the library built in his honour. Not only was ancient Ephesus a great place of learning, new excavations show how rich their lives were with ornate rooms covered in elaborate frescoes and mosaic floors. Such a high standard of living in a city that was thriving around the time of Christ. The city was the uh, capital city of the Asia Minor. So and in that time there was a, a harbour, the harbour it's mean trade. And uh, the city was very rich uh, during the first century. Genghis Icton, the chief archaeologist at Ephesus, is restoring a milestone he's uncovered. Until now, Ephesus was thought to be around 3,000 years old, but Genghis has proof it's much, much older. Five years ago, I founded one uh, settlement, according to Schertz, 
the dating uh, was uh, six uh, millennium, I mean the cal calculatic or uh, early Neolithic age. 4,000 years before Christ, of you course. believe man was living right here? O of course, of course. These are the ruins of a large Roman spa city. It had its own amphitheatre, seating 12,000 people. And its heart was this sacred pool. <sighs> After all that riding, no better way to relax than amidst these genuine Roman columns here in the thermal spa at Bahamukali. From 200 years BC, people travel long distances to enjoy the curative powers of these warm therapeutic waters. Today, the area is still high in the agenda for travellers, for both the rejuvenating pools and these strange formations. Now it looks like snow, but in fact what's happened is that the calcium in the thermal water has flowed over the cliffside, cooled and hardened. It's left the most exquisite formations. Natural shells, pools and stalactites, and it's certainly worth exploring, starting at the base of the cliff and tracing a hot stream uphill. Others are revelling in it too. Tourists and locals. And at the top, if you've timed it properly, you'll be rewarded with a golden Turkish sunset. We're heading south once more, towards the Mediterranean Sea. In a field of flowering mustard plants, we see a vision of the uncomplicated rural life of Turkey, where a horse and furrow are still used to plough fields, and just passing through warrants a friendly country wave. Further on, I inspect a roadside yurt home to Ramazan and his family. So Ramazan, as I understand it, what you're telling me that is that the roof here is made from the uh, goat, the goat wool. Uh, you've got uh, timber, of course, as the outer uh, frame. And also wool make these gloves. And there are about 50 or 60 yurts like this. You live in this all year round, eh? It's a modest living. A far cry from our next stop. This is Antalya, Turkey's biggest port on the Mediterranean, a harbour built by the Romans. From here, we head out for the day on a motor yacht to explore the coast. Turning to the eastern part of Antalya. Down these very, very interesting limestone cliffs. Yes, which we call as fellas, and uh, we have small caves in inside of them. And some very interesting buildings built into the uh, side of the cliffs like, like this one here. Uh, this looks like grapevines growing all over that. Yes. Very well camouflaged. Marish, what about up ahead here? Now this is the this is what we've come to see. This this waterfall, this river empties right into the sea. The waterfall hits the water. But this river is called the Dudan River, and Dudan River just meets the Mediterranean Sea just right now and falls into the sea. And this is called as the Dudan Waterfalls. come in, Mike Ferris will, so uh, we'll see, see just how close we can get here. You right, Mike? What are you doing to me, Greg? Faster, do it. What I hadn't anticipated is how cold the Mediterranean is before summer and how strong the current is. We tried. <laughs> we tried, we failed. Current's just too strong. <laughs> Later that day, we happen upon a parade honouring Children's Day. Children from all over Turkey and neighbouring countries have travelled here to Antalya for these celebrations. Every province is represented, like Turkish Cyprus. Bordering countries like Azerbaijan are here too. 
Wearing the traditional costumes and singing the old songs of their different regions, these young ambassadors come together to celebrate the past and look to the future. Turkish Odyssey is taking us east along the Mediterranean coast. We're entering a more rugged and isolated part of Turkey with this space of plenty for all to share the road. Time of plenty too to do a job well. This lady will work a loom for two days to weave just one tablecloth. And this man will spend an entire week etching this stone. Every structure tells a story here. The stone bridge we're crossing at Koprulu Canyon was built 2,000 years ago by the Romans. And this hilltop fortress at Alanya, and known as the Kale, was built by the Romans and enlarged by the Ottoman rulers. Breathtaking views up here especially of the grand wall that once enclosed an ancient city. Slaves were once traded here and pirates ransacked the harbour. Our day ends still further along the coast with the most impressive forts. This one at Kizkalesi is known as the Maiden's Castle and started by the Byzantines. So stunning, day or night. Any wonder it featured in so many legends. North we go, away from the Mediterranean and onto settlements a world away from the mighty Roman Empire. First is what remains of the fascinating historic city of Manazan. Carved into the rocky hillside is an entire town six stories high. From the sixth century, rooms were carved out of the soft volcanic rock, creating houses that people have been living in ever since. The only way up is to climb on precarious holes in the rock wall. This man on his way up to rooms used for storage. We're seeing all manner of things stored here. Uh, grain, for instance, wool. Yeah, basically it's grain and corns and these uh, uh, kind of uh, food uh, has been uh, stored in these uh, small rooms inside on the rocks. Cool in the hottest of Turkish summers is a laborious procedure in getting the grain down. At least two men are needed to haul down every bag of grain. Of course, the devout Turks had to include a mosque for those daily prayers. We are welcomed into a very large room where the walls and roof are in much the same condition as they were when first dug out more than a thousand years ago. So the mosque, of course, is still being used actively five times a day. Yes, that's right. As uh, we, uh, we can use, as you see also, there's a gentleman just which is praying right now, which is the for, uh, afternoon pray, and still used by the whole local people. The floor, you'll notice, is covered in large, colourful rugs. These have been created right below the cliff city, all spun before being coloured. We're watching some wool virtually straight off the sheep's back. It's been dyed, it's been coloured. That's right. They just dyed it from the plant's roots. Now, the dyed wool is made into these large carpets. We're watching three women right now weaving this large carpet. Uh, it just takes quite a long period. Depends on the bigness of the uh, carpet. It takes from at least from three months to six months. 
Mamazan, a glimpse of life from another millennium and a taste of an even more remarkable settlement further north. Up, up and away we wheel it. Up through the mountainous Balkar Dogleri region of central Turkey. Ahead, proof that simple things can be the most effective. We're about to meet the locals of Lava Town. We're riding now into one of Turkey's hidden treasures. This is Cappadocia. Above ground, it's a moonscape, but below the surface, it's another world. Greg, Cappadocia was laid down a couple of million years ago when two active volcanoes in this area erupted more or less simultaneously. And then the hills have been eroded with wind and rain and ice to form these amazing sculptures you see now. So the original troglodytes lived here, right? Eh? Original troglodyte, troglodyte dwelling, yeah. There are underground cities here, they still live in caves. There are 36 underground cities in this plateau. The geological formations of Cappadocia are one of the natural wonders of the world. A moonscape of fairy chimneys created over millions of years. First came the volcano some 10 million years ago, covering the region with lava and ash. What followed was erosion, slowly whittling the lava away to create the moonscape that is Cappadocia today. And finally came the humans. 4,000 years ago, people moved into these ready-made homes that were weatherproof and invader-proof. They added their own touches by digging more rooms and passageways and decorating them in their own style. Today, thousands still live in this cave city. Homes and businesses complete with water and electricity. And even the Cappadocian coppers keep the peace from the hollowed spires. Typical of these homes is the one occupied by Barish's friend, Azir, and his family. Now that's a traditional greeting, is it? Kissing like that? Yes, wherever we see each other, we just kiss each other and shake hands. That shows our hospitality and welcome. Guests are welcome with a traditional Turkish hot apple tea. Tell me about this house. How old would this be? Well, this is, as he knows, it comes from his grandfather, which we are talking about 150 years back. So maybe it can be older than that one. But one of the rooms is only enlarged you know, 45 years ago. The bedroom has uh, two very large beds uh, adorning this very large bedroom. Kitchen, very practical, very spartan, and all the implements uh, arranged on the wall. There's an inbuilt storeroom and a vent tunnel through the earth above to take smoke from the fire. Roofs and walls have been covered with classic Turkish carpets, and not simply to make a design statement. Well, the carpets are is the tradition of the Turkish people, which every, everyone has their carpets in their house. Hand-woven carpets, mostly is wool, which keeps warm inside also. It so gets cold in the winter time in Cappadocia. Later, we explore an entire underground town. This has a network of passages leading to rooms eight storeys down. And no need to bring in outside materials. This altar was carved out of the soft volcanic rock. Fridges, no need for them either. Now these giant bins would have stored all their food. They would have stored meat and vegetables, potatoes, grain of course, and it would have been cool enough down here to keep all of that very fresh. During the Arab invasions, the Christians hid down here. In the Middle Ages, they had this wonderful efficient security system using these rolling stones, where they would place a timber spindle in the middle to facilitate ease of rolling this stone in front of the doorways against invading armies. So it would have blocked any conquerors, eh? Absolutely, repel borders. 
Underground cities like this are still being discovered all over Cappadocia. There's also the well-preserved ruins of many churches. Their evidence, there was a large settlement of Christian monks well over a thousand years ago. Wow, well this buckle church was carved into the hillside in the 10th and 11th centuries by the monks and magnificent frescoes. Yeah, it was done in two stages, uh, Greg. The first half that we're standing in was 10th century and uh, the chapel behind us there, that wonderfully uh, complex chapel was uh, carved in the 11th century. The paintings on the walls and ceilings are still in remarkably good condition created at the height of the golden period of Byzantine art. So the monks have painted on the walls here scenes from the Bible. They're all Bible scenes. They all tell a story uh, as uh, related in the Bible. In the spirit of harmony and heritage, the once divine Byzantine buckle church is in the process of restoration. Outside, scenes that would not have been out of place when the church's original frescoes were drying. The farmers of Cappadocia still use the unmechanised transport and farming tools of centuries past. To reach their properties, they've developed a network of trails that take them right through the heart of the Cappadocia moonscape. I set off on the tail of one farmer and find myself led to a typical local pottery. In this underground cavern, they specialise in decorative plates. Painters work in teams to create intricate artwork. Another speciality are simple teapots for that much drunk and appreciated spicy apple tea. Spouts and handles. They're all shaped at speed by a craftsman who turns out dozens every day. If Cappadocia is a must-see for all who visit Turkey, then an early morning hot air balloon flight is a must-do. What a tremendous way to see Cappadocia. We've taken off just before dawn. The first rays of sunlight are now caressing this valley, and we're travelling all the way down, ever so close to these formations. Brilliant. Weaving our balloon between the precious and legally protected spires is our very capable Turkish pilot, Swat. We are using the winds, the winds directions. At different levels of the air, the wind direction is changeable, so you have to find the suitable wind. Now tell us, you took off in the middle of those spires, you had to have the right wind, otherwise you would crash into the side of some of those spires. Yes, yes, that's right. So how do you avoid that? Well, uh, we don't want to uh, come close too much. Up here, no one is afraid. Excited, yes. <laughs> this is brilliant, I love it. The colours are changing with the sunlight. It's terrific. It's up here that I learn a sad truth. Cappadocia is slowly crumbling. It's crumbling because of the erosion by the rain and the wind. But the new formations are coming out also up on the mountains. So it will take thousands of years, but we will have the chimneys in the future also. So as one Cappadocia disappears, we get a new one, eh? Yes, it will just continue all the years. SWAT doesn't want to lose a moment of spire flying time. Because you have to be really, really experienced balloon pilot. And brave. And brave. Anyway, all the balloon pilots are brave, but you have to need more experience to fly in Cappadocia. A thrill seeker he may be, but SWAT is very aware of the six month jail sentence if he crashes into one of the formations. So, if the choice is a spire or a tree, he goes for the tree. Very low. Looks like he's going to hit one of those trees, eh? Maybe a bit. Yeah. Ah. Oops, <laughs> is Swat napping? Or is he out to give a trusting traveller a bit of a wind-up? Did you mean to go that close? Uh, yes. Oh. <laughs> no, plant is an also adventure too. You have to have a more adrenaline. Yeah. And the adrenaline's pumping right now, eh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's all over. Our fuel almost out. It's time to touch down, ever so gently. Yeah. Oh. Look at this car. 
What better way to wind down than in a genuine Turkish bath? First, a Turkish love song. Nineteen-year-old Kirksol is playing a stringed instrument from the Ottoman days, known as a balama. Then the full treatment. Froth and bubbles and a good solid scrub. Capping off what has been a truly exhilarating day, folkloric dances, Turkey style. Reflecting the Turks' energy and flamboyance, the traditional music and dance is enthralling. And played beside a bonfire, alongside the volcanic cliffs of Cappadocia, this is truly a magical experience. Inside, we've been promised one more Turkish tradition, a genuine belly dance. These bellies are real all right, but hey, the real thing is much more revealing. From Cappadocia, we head north once more, across the vast Anatolian plains, where human settlements 10,000 years old, the earliest known, have been found. In the Turkish capital of Ankara, we stock up on the freshest of fruit and nuts. Dominating the center of Ankara is the imposing mausoleum of Kemal Ataturk. Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, our national hero, which gave the independence to the people of Turks, and he is the founder of the Republic of Turkey, the Democratic Republic of Turkey. So it means so much to Turkish people. The mausoleum has the status of a shrine, and its own unit of soldiers, with the guard changed every two hours. Inside, Ataturk's body is kept in a massive granite tomb where Turks, like Barish, flock to pay homage to their idol. Ataturk memorabilia is collected in the museum, his cars and the gun carriage used to transport his body. Just north of Ankara is one of Turkey's best kept secrets. This is Saffron Balu, a small town of well-preserved Ottoman houses. And home to the growers of that exotic and very expensive spice saffron. I'm adopted by a young army conscript, Serkan Halei, who seizes the opportunity to show off his town's prized products. After harvest, the saffron leaves are dried placed in tiny jars and sold in local stores. To get this quantity, which is one gram, yep. you would have to harvest, what, 150 leaves 150 or so? 150 leaves, yeah, wow. to get a one gram. Of. Wow. So that makes it almost as valuable as uh, gold. Well, let's pour out just this, uh, this one gram here to see just how. Yep. And this would cost about four million lira, wouldn't it? Yeah. Just, just for that small quantity. Uh, this amount of saffron, uh, turns a ton of water into yellow. Speaking of delights, Serkon guesses correctly that I could be tempted by another of the local specialities, Turkish delights. Delectable morsels of sweetness in every possible shape and taste, simply irresistible. So you yeah. get Turkish delight with saffron included? Yeah, so saffron gives this yellowish color to Turkish delight. Okay, you want to try a bit? This is, sure. You try. Well, you try the whole thing. You can't stop me trying. <laughs> <laughs> Curious as to how these delights are created, well, watch the experts. 
First, a mixture of sugar and water, gelatin and flavoring, is churned together. Then it's poured onto trays and allowed to cool. Extras like nuts and saffrons are sprinkled on top. And then it's ready to slice up and package for sale to all the sweet tooths. Our taste buds tell us we shouldn't leave Saffron Baloo without sampling one final culinary delight. It's called Tandir, land that's been slow baked in an earth oven. Once the lamb carcass has been lowered into the coals, the oven is sealed with clay. Two hours later, the seal is broken. The lamb raised and sliced, leaving me to willingly do a taste test on the most succulent lamb I've ever eaten. Our Turkish odyssey is drawing to a close. In the final days, my trusty bike carries me even further north to the wild Black Sea. Over the last month, we've clocked up 4,000 kilometres in a trip that has taken us right around Western Turkey. We've experienced a fascinating spectrum of lives and moments from ancient and modern Turkey. But now, it's time to return to where it all began, the Blue Mosque of Istanbul.